So I wanted to start with just a just a couple of terms because we've sort of thrown them around in the in the context of this product and, and just so that we're all on the same page here with the notion of a Kubernetes operator. And it, it really is a combination of a custom resource definition. And this is the idea that we could have Kubernetes manage um, custom objects that aren't part of the native Kubernetes. So you define this custom resource definition, which is essentially the set of met metadata that you want to, to store about any object, whether you're defining a virtual machine or just my custom object, whatever it is. And Kubernetes inherently knows how to create that object within its management plane and delete it and keep its desired state um, and active state together like it's a regular object. If you just have a custom resource definition, though, there's nothing kind of going on with it. It's sort of like just a data store. If you add a controller to it, the controller is the thing that now can do something once you instantiate your object. So if you had a custom object for a database, you would get an object in Kubernetes, but to actually create the database, which may run in a VM, for instance, you would need a controller to watch and then go ahead and, and create that. The combination of this resource definition and a controller is what we think of when we say a Kubernetes operator. And, and we make extensive use of that in the, in the product, as I'll go into. I'm going to skip that basis of time. The second thing is this, this idea of cluster API. And this is an open source project that's part of the Kubernetes lifecycle SIG. And what it attempts to do is to have a community-driven way, an open source project, for um, ha managing the lifecycle of a Kubernetes cluster using Kubernetes itself. So you start out with this sort of bootstrap Kubernetes cluster or management cluster that gives you an API. You have a whole bunch of custom resources or op operators that would allow you to instantiate a Kubernetes cluster. And so for instance, as a user, I might say, give me a Kubernetes cluster. I would get these objects created in my bootstrap cluster, a cluster, machine classes, um, machines, machine deployment. These are just objects that are holding configuration spec, the desired state for the application. It's not actually creating anything underneath it. Then there are a set of providers. Those are the um, specific to the infrastructure platform underneath that ultimately knows in order to instantiate this cluster, which has a certain number of machines, which are configured a certain way, I have to create VMs underneath it, and I have to provide that configuration. So this is an open source way to do it, and across VMware, all of our Kubernetes offerings are standardizing on using cluster API as the, the means of instantiating and doing lifecycle management of, of Kubernetes clusters. So if we take this and we look at um, the Project Pacific architecture a little bit differently, we have the SDDC underneath, and then we're creating one or more supervisor clusters. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between um, ESXi cluster and a supervisor cluster. And we would create VMs or, or we'd create namespaces on top of that. And you see this is a view of vCenter where we have a summary page for a, a namespace. Within that namespace, as soon as I create it, I can do things like you know, add permissions. It's integrated with SSO. So I, I can select a particular role. Those roles are actually <coughs> cluster roles in Kubernetes. So authentication of a set of users is done through vCenter, but the actual authorization, what they're allowed to do, is implemented through Kubernetes. So you'll see as we go through this, these are, these are all deep implementations or integrations between vSphere and Kubernetes. We're not just layering it on top in any way. The second thing is storage integration. When I create a storage policy in vSphere, I can assign them to the namespaces. When I do that, that actually creates a storage class in the underlying Kubernetes cluster and sets um, storage quotas on that using Kubernetes itself to, to manage the quotas on that storage. The, and the other thing in this is that you can see at a glance the activity within your namespace. So if we're thinking about the namespace as the unit of abstraction or the envelope that the VI admin is managing within, now they can see all the pods that are running. They can see the Kubernetes clusters that are running, the resource consumption by namespace rather than looking at it at, at some other, you know, in, in inventory at some other way by Kubernetes or by a vSphere cluster or at ind the individual VM level. So if we start building this up, I can create multiple namespaces. You know, I can run these native pods on, uh, on those ESXi hosts. 
And then we start layering these operators in here. So specific capability that we've created. This is a, a set of custom resource definitions and controllers that know how to instantiate virtual machines. You give it uh, a virtual machine specification, give it a virtual machine class that defines the size, the CPU and memory that you want for it, maybe the image that's associate, associated with it, the network interfaces, you know, all of that sort of stuff. We're able to instantiate a VM using a declarative spec file through the Kubernetes API in the supervisor cluster. We've mentioned that you can run pod uh, and, and VMs in the same context within a namespace, but on the same cluster. There are two additional operators here. And um, this, this gets a little bit confusing, but we'll start here with this, this managed Kubernetes operator. This is an easy button. This is the idea that I could, through a very simple specification, I can deploy an opinionated Kubernetes cluster. So somebody who is not a Kubernetes developer or engineer or has a basic knowledge of what they want would be able to submit a, a very short spec file and the managed Kubernetes operator would actually create the cluster from that. Now what happens is the managed Kubernetes operator creates specification, the cluster API spec, which is then handled by the Kubernetes operator, which is our implementation of the cluster API spec which ultimately creates specification files to build the VMs underneath. That may be a little bit confusing, but the first question becomes, why do I need both of these? And the reason is Cluster API is really um, um, powerful in that you could create a cluster with any configuration you wanted. Like I could decide I wanted to run uh, OpenShift on vSphere and, and submit a spec file that is interpreted by the um, Kubernetes operator. But the reality is that's hundreds of lines of, of YAML that defines that specification, creating a bunch of objects that, are, that you would see visible in your cluster. If you're not a Kubernetes engineer and you just need a cluster and you want us to figure out an opinionated way to deploy it, then you submit a very simple spec to the managed Kubernetes um, through the managed Kubernetes operator. So it looks like this. I, I create that simple spec. This is an object, that, one of those custom resource objects that's created in the supervisor cluster. I don't have anything underneath it. There's no infrastructure created at this point. But a set of specifications are submitted that are interpreted by the Kubernetes operator to create all of these other components that cluster API instantiates when it creates a cluster. And these are all things that are, that are being watched by different controllers to keep the desired state and actual state in sync in the, in the cluster. Ultimately, that causes specifications to be submitted to and interpreted by the, the VM operator, so you get a set of VMs that are then bootstrapped in the way that you need them to be bootstrapped for the, um, for the cluster. And you have, then you have a Kubernetes cluster that's running out there. Does that make sense or is that incredibly confusing? <laughs> Maybe give us the, the use cases for both the supervisor cluster sure. Sure. Guest cluster. I, I think of the supervisor cluster as uh, as a control plane. That generally speaking, um, we would we would use this as something that is fairly persistent. It doesn't get upgraded quite as as often as you would see these on demand clusters, and it it allows you to layer services on top of it. It also provides the mechanism for us having this API that developers can use to consume infrastructure. But developers when they're working with Kubernetes clusters, they um, generally are wanting the latest version of upstream Kubernetes. They may instantiate the cluster as part of a pipeline, run some set of jobs and tear it down. It's very dynamic. And so we, we would expect that DevOps teams would be, um, would be using this as a mechanism for generating infrastructure and developers potentially are just using it as part of their regular you know, development process when they so need things on demand. A guest cluster is kind of ephemeral. It can be created and torn down as part of a CI CD pipeline? It, it could, yes. And it may be longer lived. There's, there's use cases where we've seen where some customers like to have a single or few large clusters and they use a namespace construct as multi-tenancy. And, and that's how they isolate it. But we've also seen a lot of customers who've said that that's very limiting given, given the velocity that their development teams want to, to work at and the fact that each one of these clusters may be different. You might have one that has certain admission controllers or wants to configure the, the kubelet in a certain way. Um, 
that is very different from another team. And so each individual team would want to stand up their own set of clusters and, and provide yeah. access to it. And so what about the architecture of the, um, of the control plan of Kubernetes, both on the supervisor and in the, in the guest clusters? Is it a single VM providing all of the Kubernetes APIs, or is it highly available? So, is it yeah, in the, in the supervisor cluster and in the guest cluster, you'll, you'll have three master nodes fronted right. by a load balancer, so you have, you have multi-master support in both of those. Right. And that, that goes for the Etsy uh, database behind it as well? Yeah, the, each master node has um, the okay, it's stack with Etsy. Okay, co-located on each master yeah. node, okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, the next thing in, in this, and I'm jumping through some of the things, is this is how we're, we're doing that instantiation of the, uh, of the third-party applications as well. So you imagine a marketplace that's, that's out there um, that the VI admin or one of the platform operators, depending on the individual business, could, when they create a namespace, could enable the set of applications that are available in that namespace as well. So the tooling for that particular development team. And then that would instantiate an operator for that into the supervisor database that would be available. And then a simple YAML file or simple YAML specification would allow them to instantiate it. Now, what's, what's important about this that's different, this is not creating a VM that happens to have SQL Server um, in the image, right? That now somebody has to go start it up. This is taking the domain expertise of the platform team that may, may work on a particular um, product and incorporating that into a controller so that when the, when the developer says, I need a SQL Server cluster, they might get a three node cluster with a certain um, database schema and certain service accounts already enabled running on a particular type of storage because that's the requirement. That it's configured in a way that meets the compliance um, uh, rules for that particular organization. All that domain expertise can be built into the controller and it automa you automatically get it with a simple YAML. And so you've, you've accidentally solved one of the biggest issues with virtual machines, which is all of the data is crunched into one single image. You cannot separate the different parts of it out. That means you can apply this to virtual machines as well at some point. Uh, you can apply the concept of the, uh, of the YAML file and pulling different images for the virtual machines. Yeah. So, uh, I don't understand uh, uh, just a little bit of uh, the relationship between the uh, sys administrator and the developer because where, where can I stop the developer, the developer to get all the resources from my mm -hmm. data center? Name when space. I create this namespace, ah, okay, okay, okay. I'm, I'm saying I can put limits on there. I could say this is the amount of CPU, storage, and memory that can be consumed by this namespace. Okay, so and the then namespace is the fence. The namespace the is the unit of governance instead of the individual VM. Okay, I'm gonna jump past this. We got about five minutes. Um, the other thing is, NSX can be a part of this. So if you've if you've in, installed NSX, um, we can automate the creation of NSX objects in here. So they they can be objects in the supervisor cluster that are then instantiated in in, in NSX. So load balancers, for instance, when we deploy the supervisor, we deploy a T0 router. We create T1 routers um, at each supervisor cluster. Each namespace gets a logical switch with its own network segments. <clears throat> distributed firewall is part of this, so you can use Kubernetes network policy to control ingress and egress into and out of the, the clusters, but also within namespaces, across namespaces uh, in the supervisor cluster. Jared had mentioned um, that it's integrated with the um, cloud native storage as well. I'll just skip to a, an example of that here where if you're not familiar with this, this is creating a persistent volume claim in, uh, in Kubernetes. What that does with a single YAML file, <coughs> it creates a persistent volume claim. It, it binds a Kubernetes persistent volume to it and automatically creates a vSphere volume. And that's one of those new first class disks that are independent of VMs that we manage as a first level object. There's also um, new UI for this. So the next step in this would be to actually create a pod, and as part of that, attach that persistent volume to it and mount it on the file system so that it's, it's usable within that pod. And then when we look over at the, at the UI, you can see this, this new cloud-native storage um, container-native plugin. Notice that the, um, 
that the UUID for this vSphere volume maps back into the volume here in Kubernetes, um, and you can track what claim it was associated with, what uh, namespace it came from, even the, the pod that it's attached to. So again, another example, where we're really marrying vSphere and, and um, Kubernetes together in this environment. <coughs> Um, I wanted to jump back to the to the Kubernetes service again, just to give you a, a little different visual on that. You know, these how these operators work together, because I think it's confusing, and, and and I thought this might be a useful way to look at it. So, as a developer who decides, I would like to have a Kubernetes cluster. I want it to have three worker nodes. I want this version of Kubernetes um, running. I want the workers to be of machine class small, whatever that happens to be. And I want the overlay networking inside the nodes. That's the, the, the way that the pods themselves are communicating. I want that to be Calico. Maybe I have a choice of Calico and NSX in the, in the current development cycle that we're working on. And so that gets submitted and that causes this managed cluster object to be created in the supervisor. It also causes um, the, spec the specifications to be created that are then seen by the, the Kubernetes operator and, I, and these other objects are created within the supervisor cluster. So is network traffic that goes inside of Calico then virtualized by NSXT on the kind of so NS, no, Well, NSXT or um, sort of standard um, vSphere networking to yeah. the nodes themselves, yeah. but then Calico would be in, inside the nodes. Yeah, so it's kind of a nested Calico implementation. The, yeah, the point being, though, it, it doesn't route outside the, no, sure. outside the beams. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's an overlay. So then ultimately the specification is submitted to the, or is handled by the VM operator, which causes the VMs to be created. I think these are confusing because they're just objects in, in Kubernetes. They're not actually infrastructure until the VMs get created at the bottom. But there's a controller associated with each one of those that's sitting there watching, trying to make sure that that little piece of this is in sync, the desired state versus the actual state. And then we've got two minutes left, and I thought we could spend that in any other questions you might have around the, um, the native pods. So when Jared talked about this, um, you know, this is an ESX host. He focused on some of the details here around the Linux kernel. In ESX itself, um, one other thing to mention is that we implemented an image service in this so that um, not only are we instantiating a pod, but we have to to sort of replicate the kind of functionality you would think about in the Docker image service. The first time I deploy a container, I go pull it from a registry and download it. And I, I need to store it locally um, so that next time I don't have to go get it, right? So, so that image caching service was built into ESX. It's actually part of the Spearlet. Is, um, it, is it a native implementation or is it Docker's? It's a native implementation, yeah. And so what about support for things like Helm? I mean, Helm is just, again, the API is, uh, is Kubernetes, yeah. right? So Kubernetes supports, you know, you can install Helm on top of your Kubernetes yeah. cluster, and then you can use that to deploy. That, that's supported on the supervisor cluster, too? Yes. Okay. Okay, so we've got about a minute left. Um, do we have other questions on this? I'd love to know what you guys think. I mean, we've been talking... Uh, Give us some impressions. It's impressive. I'm excited about it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, this is solving a lot of issues. It's going to make a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the issues that you had with Kubernetes and security and administration and management. That's all. You don't have to worry about it anymore. It gets all encapsulated in here. You know, so it's, I think it's really cool. I think it's going to be a game changer. Are you guys thinking about this as um, being embraced initially for on-premises workloads uh, and for new application development, or as a mechanism to refactor existing applications? I mean, I think that um, by nature of the vSphere install base, um, you know, the, the target here is people with with vSphere. Clearly, that that this sort of brings you into the world of cloud and you know e even for um, 
existing applications, you can actually get some of the benefits of cloud and Kubernetes, even for things like VM-based applications. So, so my guess is, and I'm now speculating about who's going to adopt this, my speculation is that initially you see the biggest growth there in some of the on-prem deployments and, and, yeah, helping with some of those application infrastructure modernization products as well. Um, that said, I think our, our goal here, you know, we, we want to make this equally available across, you know, VMC and VCPP and VCD and VCF and all the other uh, sort of avenues where uh, people use vSphere. And we think that, um, you know, a lot of our initial reactions, we, we've seen that um, teams that might have not even been considering vSphere for new application development, when they see the kinds of things they can do with Pacific, they're actually rethinking that and saying, actually, this is going to help. Uh, particularly if, you, you know, if you're building a mission-critical application and you need security and availability and disaster recovery, I don't know of a better way to achieve that than with Project Pacific. Where do you think that there will be a migration from, a migration from EKS users? Uh, I, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, I think that if people, people running uh, Kubernetes on vSphere today are, are going to want to take advantage of the built-in capabilities in the platform. It's just going to be simpler and easier. 